Doing research for an upcoming video about wacky rock star hijinks, I came across a man just so wacky, so chocked full of hijinks that I thought he deserved a video just for him. That man's name is... Keith Moon is an enigma. He was a riddle, wrapped in a question, microwaved in a mystery, and drizzled with a secret sauce reduction. Part man, part animal. Lover of mayhem and hater of toilets, the drummer for The Who will go down as one of the wildest, most destructive men in all of rock and roll history. So let's talk about the princely prankster, the hotel horror, the bathroom bomber himself. People always, they, they say, Keith, you're so outrageous in hotels, you know, I mean, why do, you know, why do hotels let you in? And I, I can't answer that question. For rock stars, wrecking hotel rooms is an art form in and of itself. And if trashing a room is art, Keith Moon is fucking Da Vinci. Keith Moon practically pioneered the field of room wreckery. He was one of the first, and still arguably one of, if not the very best, in the game. And this wasn't living up to some rock star cliche for him either. This hadn't become a trope at the time. He was the trope. This man just genuinely enjoyed destroying the state of his temporary lodging. He was just living his truth. I'm gonna kick it off with Keith's 21st birthday. A pretty mellow incident, very Disney Channel friendly. You could air it after Fish Tales. Zack and Cody could guest star. The man had, of course, never had a drop of alcohol before that day because that would be illegal and immoral. And Keith Moon is not about that life, no. Little Mooney, no. Never! So he had one single drink responsibly with a close circle of friends, and then drove a stolen Lincoln Continental into the swimming pool of a Holiday Inn. The legal age to drink was actually 18 at the time, plus he's British, so I'm sure they offered him and his mom a pint while she was still screaming in the stirrups, but just like, let me live a little man, okay? So a responsible brewski with the boys wasn't exactly how it went down, but luckily there is a record from several people there at the time that lays out pretty much the whole night, and it is, it's a bit of a doozy. Ain't no party like a Keith Moon party, because a Keith Moon party will leave you dead or arrested. I'll give you a little timeline of events here. The band crushes a show in Detroit and heads back to the Holiday Inn. Truly cannot have shit in Detroit. Also, there's a guy named Carl there as well. Just remember him for later. Just tuck that in your brain. Keith Moon is then delivered not one, not two, but many, many cakes. I don't know how many cakes he got. The sources say anything from like four to a hundred, so just um, picture a lot of cakes. All of them were in the shape of five edible drums that are stacked on top of each other. And that's nice, you know, that is very sweet. Y you'd think somebody would really savor that, you know, genuinely appreciate the gesture, maybe share it with their friends. Keith begins throwing the cake at everyone in the room like a monkey with its own shit, to which all the other bandmates return fire. Which honestly I would do too if a monkey started throwing its shit at me, I would just shit in my own hand and throw it right back. That is a power move right there. So they're plopping pastry, they're flinging frosting left and right, innocent enough, you know. One of them said it took five minutes for the whole room to look like the inside of a cake. Not that big a deal, we've all converted a hotel room into a tasty little treat, you know, we've been there. But the hotel manager, he hears the ruckus and he heads on down to the room. He just rocks on down to Moontown. He then opens the door and witnesses the Disney XD level food fight ensuing within. And they're pretty much caught red-handed at that point, it's pretty hard to act innocent when there's chocolate on the ceiling and you're standing in a puddle of custard. The manager barges in and says, God damn it, this sounds more like a revolution than a birthday party, to which Keith responds by shoving what remained of the first cake directly in his face. Which, like, yeah. That's an act of war right there. That is a revolution, you know, if they went a little bit further with it, I think they could have pulled off a successful coup. I'm the hotel manager. No. After this, one of Keith's bandmates told the manager that they'd wind it down, which, like, the guy already has strawberry filling in his eyebrows. I think it's a little bit late for that. Guy's got a cherry on his head, a couple candles sticking out of his nose, the whole room looks like the house at the end of Cat in the Hat, and this dude's just like, yeah, we're ready to take it down a notch, sir. There's nothing to worry about here. Against the odds, though, this guy was apparently both a terrible manager and an absolute cuck, because he was kind of just like, 
okay, you'd better, and then he just, he, he just left. I don't know, man, the 60s were a different time. Babies were still having paint chips for breakfast and everyone was inhaling lead by the lung full every time they went outside, but like, it, they're not gonna wind it down a notch, man. He deserved what happened after this for leaving, honestly. So after MC Pain Eater walked out of the room, still covered in cake, probably planning his trip to the dry cleaners, Keith proceeded to wind down from the cake slinging by hucking beer bottles out of the window into the pool below. After he was satisfied with how filled the pool was with broken glass, he thought to himself, I'm gonna go steal a car. That, that sounds like a good idea. That That's the move. And let's go ahead and let him recount what happened with that little escapade. Half a dozen cars were parked around this swimming pool. I ran out, jumped into the first car I came to, which was a brand new Lincoln Continental. It was parked on a slight hill, and when I took the handbrake off, it started to roll, and it smashed straight through this pool surround fence, and the whole Lincoln Continental went right into the swimming pool, with me in it. <laughs> in it. <laughs> so there I was, sitting in the driver's seat of a Lincoln Continental, underwater. And the water was pouring in, coming in through the bloody pedal holes in the floorboard, squirting in through the windows. In a startling moment of logic, I said, Well, I can't open the doors until the pressure is the same. It's amazing how I remembered those things from me physics class. So I'm sitting there, thinking about me situation, and the water creeps up to me nose. When there's just enough air on the top of the car to take a gulp, I fill up my lungs, throw open the door, and go rising to the top of the pool. And then I went back to the party, streaming water. I'm actually quite impressed that this man is so drunk that he is drifting a luxury vehicle into a man-made body of water, but still has the lucidity to go, Wait just a minute, Keith. Think back to Miss Hawthorne's class. Also, is that the kind of shit they teach in England? Well, kids, if you have a completely blitzed and drive a car into a swimming hole, first of all, don't feel bad. Happens to all of us from time to time. Just remember to keep those doors shut until the minute before you drown, and then go ahead and flop your saw good body up to the surface. So Keith comes back inside, dripping wet, walks over to the room, leaving his little piss trail in the hallway, and who do you think comes in after him? Cake guy, that is correct. The manager peeps his head in the room and is like, um, guys, um, do you, re uh, do you remember how we said you could maybe turn it down a bit? Possibly, maybe, maybe, possibly? He throws the second cake in the manager's face and then immediately proceeds to grab Carl by the pockets and savagely rip his pants off from there to the knee. Why did he do that? I, I don't fucking know. No one knows why he did anything. I he just does. I don't know. Also, why stop there? Just rip the pants completely off at that point. You're halfway there. And that's an impressive feat, too. This was the 60s. Okay, them jeans was built to last. I mean, have you ever tried to rip a man's pants off with sheer manpower by savagely pulling on his pockets? I have. And let me tell you, it is not easy. Keith then laughs maniacally in Carl's face, as one does in that situation, to which Carl responds by ripping Keith's pants off so hard that the stitching ripped in every seam, as one does in that situation. So this story's been pretty tame up to this point, you know, pretty lax, pretty chill even, but this is honestly the point where I'm like, really? Did this shit really go down? This, this is a little fucking ridiculous. So apparently this whole time there has been a cop, like a legitimate cop, not like a bodyguard, standing outside of the hotel room to protect the band from like whoever wants to mess with them, you know? And Keith is a rock star, if you recall, so he is going commando, obviously. He's just gotta feel that crispy denim on the old snow globes. So when Carl ripped Keith's pants off, he is now at the mercy of the breeze, if you know what I mean. In a tank top, swinging low into the left. Man, I really cannot avoid a penis cameo in a single video, can I? So the cop spots Keith's wiggle worm and his pair of koosh balls, informs him that he is now going to have to arrest him for breaking Michigan state law, pulls out a gun and aims it at Keith's monstrous meat mound. Which like, the guy just spent an hour hucking beer bottles out the window and then drove a stolen car into a swimming pool, and now you're arresting him for a little tip slip in his own hotel room? Where are your priorities, sir? What did they teach you at the academy? All right, boys, we have a strict no testicle tolerance policy here in the great state of Michigan, which we expect you as defenders of the public to uphold. If any single one of you ever sees a pair of free swinging gonads in the Great Lakes state, you shoot that some bitch straight in the pecker. Do you understand me? Sir, yes, sir! I guess the cop was standing inside the hotel, you know, outside of the room in the hallway, and the crash happened outside by the pool, so it is possible that he didn't hear or see that. And when Keith walked back inside dripping wet, he could have just been like, man, this fella sure can not sweat, huh? So maybe I believe this is the first illegal thing he'd seen that night, but like, 
still. So the cops got his revolver trained on the old sin snake, and Keith immediately bolts away to receive some unintended consequences. I ran. I started to leg it out the door, and I slipped on a piece of marzipan and fell flat on me face and knocked out me tooth. Ooh, the cake strikes back. Keith is then rushed to the dentist, where allegedly they operated on him without any anesthesia because he was just so drunk. Which again, I was like, really? Do they actually do that? But like, you know, I could see if he was really fucked up, why anesthesia might be a little dangerous to give to an incredibly drunk person. And also, again, it is the 60s. That's like 20 years removed from it being mandatory for a housewife to get a lobotomy, so they might have just been doing shit, I don't know. While Keith was gone, the rest of the band stayed behind to get incredibly ball-slappingly drunk and just absolutely go bananas. I'm talking dangerously bananas. Like, diabolically bananas. They started ripping off railings, throwing them in the pool, ripping vending machines off the wall to get quote-unquote crisps. Ugh, British people. They ended up drunkenly fighting each other with fire extinguishers out in the parking lot, completely unaware that the foam from said fire extinguishers rips the paint off of cars during their fight in the parking lot. It's where the cars live. By the time the sun shone down on the Holiday Inn that morning, the gang was left with a room completely covered in cake, vending machines ripped off the walls, a car in the pool, well, a lot of shit in the pool, actually, six cars that needed completely new paint jobs from the fire extinguishers, a piano that they apparently burnt down at some point, and one less tooth between them. Who hasn't been there? Or I guess, who has been there? Uh, who was there? It was them. They did it. It was who? Exactly. In case you thought this was just a one-off story about a young rock star getting a little carried away on his 21st birthday, and not reflective of a pattern of behavior from a man that I can only describe as the human equivalent of a hurricane made of whiskey, rest assured you would be wrong. This man was an absolute lunatic. Another car-based incident was the time he drove his Rolls Royce through the glass front doors of a hotel, right up to the reception desk, got out, and asked for his room key. That one pretty much speaks for itself. Sometime in the late 60s, The Who was staying at a hotel in Copenhagen, Denmark. Keith Moon boasted that out of their 32-man entourage, he was the only one that ended up with a waterbed in his suite. Yes, he was the lucky fellow who could luxuriously enjoy getting seasick while asleep, while simultaneously having incredibly convincing nightmares about drowning, all from the comfort of his own bed. Keith, however, did not plan to use this bed for sleeping. No, no, that would be a major waste of this two-ton water damage opportunity we have here. That's right, this bed weighed two tons. I did the math, and that is roughly 8,000 cups of water, or 1,888,000 milliliters. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a lot of liquid. Keith's maniacal scheme was to transport the bed from the room to the elevator using sheer manpower. Not his manpower, of course, that would, that would be ridiculous. No, he would be guiding the supple young backs of his personal members of that 32-man entourage through the halls like a pharaoh among Jews. The proverbial Hasidic bed layers got the thing about halfway out of its enclosure before it burst, flooding the entire room and collapsing the ceiling of both the room below it and the one below that, sending this thing plummeting through three stories like it was the indoor pool at the Krusty Towers. Moon, being an absolute evil genius, called down to the reception desk and reported that their faulty Chinese-made waterbed had just exploded in his room, leaving him with untold thousands in ruined clothes and immeasurable emotional damages. He basically just pulled an Uno reverse card on him, just the old, uh, the old rigmarole, the old slip on a doodle. The hotel then apologized and moved the gang to the presidential suite, a room reportedly filled with luxurious finery and priceless antiques. And of course, Moon was very respectful and left this new room completely untouched right after he demolished it entirely. Around the time of this incident, Keith was staying in a less interesting locality, Saskatoon, Saskatoon, fuck, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. It's in Canada, it's Letterkenny territory. How are you now? After Moon got to his room, he thought, I'm bored. He then thought for a moment, mm, maybe I'll get some songwriting done, be a responsible, productive member of society for once. He then thought, then thought, hmm, this hotel room looks awfully not destroyed. Should I, um, should I destroy it, maybe? I wanna do that. Being in Canada, land of the lumberjack, Keith decided to go out and get an axe, return to the room, and get some wood splitting practice done on the bed, the dressers, the tables, and everything else in sight. After converting every piece of furniture in the room into firewood, Keith recalls somebody asking him, 
why did you do that? To which he replied, just trying to keep myself out of trouble, mate. And hey man, if property damage is keeping those dark thoughts at bay, you know, have at it. I think replacing a few bed frames and coffee tables is worth keeping you from getting into kind of a Buffalo Bill situation. Would you fuck me? Heath calmed down in his later years, once paying nine cab drivers $100 each to block the road in front of his hotel before throwing every piece of furniture out of the window and onto the street. I mean, this guy actively tried to avoid committing manslaughter. That is, that's downright courteous. Back when Keith was still going full hog though, he got up to some antics that were a little less than courteous, particularly involving the band's bassist, John the Ox and Swizzle. Why did they call him the Ox? Well, I don't, I don't know. But they also called him Thunderfingers. So that's fun. At Keith's first ever gig with the band, he showed up with a big ol' length of rope and tied his drum set up to pillars that were on the stage. Again, I don't know why. I have stopped asking why this man does anything at this point. During their performance, the band's PA system blew up, so Keith just performed like a like a really long drum solo. I mean, he was just smacking them bitches. Just, just demolishing them bitches. After he was finally done smacking said bitches, he got up, went over to Thunderfinger's girlfriend, took his shirt off, and wrung all of the sweat out of it into her wine glass, filling it to the brim. Did she drink it? I don't know. I don't... I don't think so. I hope not. That's still generally frowned upon. I personally would not like a, a, a friend of mine filling my girlfriend's wine glass with his own bodily fluids. Keith's terrorization... Terrorization? Is that a word? Keith's terrorization ring of both the ox and his cow did not stop there though, unfortunately. Years later, in 1972, the band was in a hotel at the Paris stop of their European tour. The ox was just about to enjoy a lovely steak dinner with his wife in their suite before a blackout drunk Keith Moon barges into the room, eats some of John's steak, pours their bottle of wine onto the carpet, pisses on their wall, and then passes out before you can say, holy shit, Keith, get out of my room. You're always doing this. Why are you always doing this? That's my steak. No, Keith, that's mine. Oh God, come on. Not the wine, Keith. Not the wine. Oh no, the wall. Oh Jesus, when did you eat asparagus? John responded by going into Keith's room, destroying all of it like Keith would normally do, and then gently placing his body down into the rubble. Which is really not a punishment for this guy, like at all. He just gets a free piggyback ride back to the room, and as far as destroying the place, he was gonna do that by himself anyway. You know, you could have at least peed on him a little bit or set him on fire or something. I mean, Keith actually like legitimately didn't even know that John did anything. He just got super drunk and then woke up in a destroyed hotel room like normal. He did not suspect that anything was awry. But Thunderfingers is just a really sweet guy, I guess. They may call him the Ox, but he will always be the goat to me. Skip it up and down. In 1967, The Who made their American debut at the Monterey Pop Festival. They absolutely blew the house down like a wolf in a pig-owned real estate venture and were immediately picked up for their first American tour as an opening act for a band called Herman's Hermits. And it was the Hermits that introduced Keith to an item that they just just really should not have introduced him to. I'm not sure that at this point they knew the full extent of Keith's absolute disregard for the integral fabric that holds society together, but either way, they ended up exposing Keith to American cherry bombs. At this point, Keith had not spent very much time outside of England, and the firecrackers they have there, known as penny bangers, because of course they are, were much less powerful than the ones we had over in the States, because of course they were. We have coffee, they have tea. We have Dennis, they have gingivitis. We have guns, they have, well, not guns. The only things that are stronger over there are the beer and the stench. Definitely not the toothpaste. Even though penny bangers weren't as strong as American cherry bombs, this was still the 60s, and we didn't worry about silly things like the fingers remaining on the hands of our children back then, so they were still quite a bit more powerful than the ones we have today. About 20 times more powerful than the ones we have today, actually. And the American ones were stronger. I'm pretty sure cherry bombs are banned today because they were basically just a hand grenade that an eight-year-old could buy at Walgreens, but back in those days, they were still very much alive and well, and they just blew Keith Moon's mind. Pun intended. <laughs> this eventually led to an unintentional discovery that lead guitarist for The Who and gold medal winner for Face Most Shrunken by Age, Pete Townshed, recounts here. One day I was in Keith's room and I said, could I use your bog? And he smiled and said, sure. 
I went in there, and there was no toilet, just sort of an S-bend, and I thought, Christ, what happened? He said, well, this cherry bomb was about to go off in me hand, and I threw it down the toilet to stop it going off. So I said, are they that powerful? And he said, yeah, it's incredible. So I said, how many of them you got? With fear in me eyes. He laughed and said, 500, and opened up a case filled to the top with cherry bombs. And of course, from that moment on, we got thrown out of every hotel we ever stayed in. That's right, Keith was blowing up toilets 30 years before Bart Simpson. This led to a couple of fun stories that seriously make me question how this man managed to not die in jail. As if the rest of them hadn't already. This first incident occurred on that initial American tour when The Who was still trying to stay at fancy hotels before getting blacklisted and forced to stay at cheap lodging like that Holiday Inn. Exactly because of incidents like this one. It's 1968. The Who is staying at the Gotham Hotel in New York, and Keith Moon had just blew up the toilet. And I think at this point, you get that I don't mean like in the Taco Bell sense of the term. After the drummer for The Who blew the loo, he flew to his shoes, hopped on the pew, and threw live explosives at the incoming police. That's correct, the cops were called and arrived shortly after the eruption of Mount Pesuvius, and Keith Moon thought it would be a good idea to hop out on the ninth floor ledge of the hotel and throw his remaining cherry bombs directly at the police. Keep in mind that these things have the ability to completely eviscerate a commode while underwater, and then consider the fact that these are the things that my man is choosing to throw at officers of the law. I have no idea how he wasn't at the very least deported for this. Keith Moon throws bombs at the police, he has to stay at at Holiday Inns. He drives a car into a pool, they give him a new tooth. I take one shit on the floor of a Target. Later on, at a hotel in the Midwestern part of the country that Keith Moon was somehow not deported from, he was sitting in the lobby, playing his band's newly released album on full blast with a portable cassette player like a modern teenager with a Beats pill on public transportation. The manager walks over to Keith and asks him to quote, please turn down that noise. Rookie mistake, we all know Keith's reputation with hotel managers this man should be fearing for his life at this point. He's just lucky there was no cake within throwing distance. So manager asks Keith to turn it down. Keith says no. He asks again. Keith says no. He asks again. Keith says no. He tells Keith he's going to call the police. Keith says cheerio, but he'll only do it if the manager agrees to come with him to his room, which is once again on the ninth floor. Coincidence? Yes. When they get to his room, Keith asks the manager to please wait outside of his door. A couple minutes later, the manager hears what sounds to be a toilet exploding. Keith opens the door to the room, releasing a plume of smoke into the manager's face and says, That, my dear boy, is noise. This, on the other hand, is the Who, and then throws the cassette player back on full blast. And Keith pulled this stunt at practically every hotel that they ever stayed at. So just imagine all the stories you just heard, but add in the small detail of Keith at some point completely removing the room's toilet from existence. Which begs the question, uh, where did he shit? In the sink? In the tub? In the sheets? In the club? It's rumored that throughout his life, the bill that Moon racked up just from blowing up toilets is somewhere in the realm of $500,000. Half a million bucks of pulverized porcelain. And that's $500,000 in yesterday money. You know, that is Ice Age money. You could probably get seven toilets for a nickel back then. That is truly a big bill from blowing bowls, boys. Silly fat bill from splatting shitters, boys. Riding on a horse, ha. So Keith was a teensy tiny bit of an alcohol addicted drug fiend. He had a giant appetite for uppers, only rivaled by his immense thirst for downers. On this particular occasion, Keith had just finished up a balanced breakfast of horse tranquilizers and brandy before going out with the Who to perform a show at a venue called Cow Palace. The ox must have been excited. Keith piddled and paddled along for a while until his head went woozy and the room went swoozy and he just straight up passed out on stage in the middle of their set. The rest of the group, annoyed, tried to wake him up and get him going again, but he just wasn't getting up. Realizing this and wanting to stick to their no refunds even if Keith Moon might die soon policy, Pete Townshed asked the audience if anyone out there knows how to play the drums. I just thought I'd say, uh, I'm serious now, let's forget all the, he's not putting it on, he's really he's not. He, uh, he's had a slight touch of the, uh, 
but it'll be all right. And uh, I just want to thank you for waiting. I get that trouble. Uh, and uh, can anybody play the drums? Yeah. Scott Halpin, 19-year-old boy and card-carrying member of Big Dick Nation, got up on stage and finished off the set while Keith Moon lay drooling, naked in a tub, while roadies tried to wake him up with a cold shower. And you know, free bath? Still probably got paid? That's a W in my book. A very similar incident occurred in Boston three years later, where Keith Moon once again passed out on stage, later woke up, went to his hotel room to throw a temper tantrum, cut himself in the process, and nearly bled to death before receiving medical attention. I see why people around him were so surprised that he lived as long as he did. I think people who knew him well uh, were surprised that he lived as long as he did. He made it longer than Hendrix or Joplin or Brian Jones or Jim Morrison. He made it four more years. <laughs> so that was pretty surprising. It's a prank. It's a prank. Oh! Oh! Keith Moon loved to brag that he was the world's greatest Keith Moon type drummer. He was also the world's greatest Keith Moon type dickhead. In addition to reducing rooms to rubble, bombing bathrooms and passing out performing, Keith Moon was also known to pull a prank or six. If he had a YouTube channel in 2015, he would have popped off, I swear to God. Some of them are pretty silly and ridiculous, so I'll start off with a pretty serious, bland one, just the time that he broke into Mick Jagger's hotel room dressed as Batman. So picture this, okay? Mick Jagger's getting sleepy. This stone's rolled enough for today, and while he can't get no satisfaction, he decides he can probably get a little shut-eye. Somebody gave him shelter, he can stop being a beast of burden, paint the inside of his eyelids black, hop into bed in a jumping jack flash, and start dreaming about honky-tonk women. Couldn't think of a way to work sympathy for the devil in there, but hey, you can't always get what you want. Jagger wakes up to find that his sleep paralysis demon looks an awful lot like Batman tonight. Little does he know it's actually Keith Moon being very fucking creepy. He just thinks it's Batman being very fucking creepy. So he hops out of bed and then pulls a knife on the Dark Knight. Keith Moon is like, hey, whoa, hey now, buddy. Whoa, whoa, slow down. Way, hey, whoa, whoa now. Hey, okay, whoa now. He hits the old, it's just a prank, bro, and tells him, hey, man, don't stab me. It's Keith. And keep in mind, this is Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, band of the the famous Keith Richards, so he obviously thinks that he's talking about that Keith, and he's like, dude, no you're not, I, I know what Keith sounds like, I hear him every morning when we have passionate gay sex, and Batman is like, no, Keith Moon. And Mick Jagger is just like, what? What the fuck? He doesn't even have anything going on with Keith Moon at the time. He just randomly decided to climb up Mick Jagger's fire escape and give him a little midnight smooch dressed like Adam West. I love this guy. He should have gotten stabbed for sure, but I love this guy. On The Who's 1967 tour of the UK, Keith very much enjoyed fucking with the band's opening act, The Herd. Keith and the Ox attached a pulley system to the gong of the band's drummer, pulling it away every time he tried to hit it, both pissing off their employee and actively making the performance of their opening act worse. But hey, gong no get hit, right? LMAO. And it's good to see that Keith and Thunderfingers can put all that beef aside for the sake of evil doing. Yeah, that is, that's sweet. Keith also wired explosives to the herd's keyboard, which he set off backstage, brutally maiming the pianist to the point of total disfigurement. I'm just kidding about that part, but like, he could have done that to so many fucking people, dude. Consider yourself lucky if you got through Keith Moon unscathed. One guy who would not get away unscathed from Keith Moon exploding instruments was Keith Moon when he blew up his drum set on live television. Story goes that Keith paid two roadies $200 and a bottle of premium French cognac each to just absolutely load the shit out of a hand cannon that Keith had planted in the kick drum. And uh, you can see how that turned out. Moon got sliced in the arm by a flying cymbal, Pete's hair caught on fire and he sustained permanent hearing loss in one ear, and Thunderfingers just kind of stood there and held his base like it was his firstborn child. He just can't tip that ox. Another more tasteful prank was when Keith and some friends dressed up as Nazis and then drove an open-top car through a heavily Jewish part of London. Uh, fun stuff. Fun, fun, family-friendly, fun stuff. In 1970, Moon and a guy from another band booked a photo shoot where they were both decked out in full Nazi regalia. For some reason. Afterward, they decided to go drinking. Still, 
in full Nazi regalia for some reason. And then they decided to keep drinking in full Nazi regalia for an entire week straight for some reason. So the pair was getting as smashed as the hopes and dreams of so many young Jewish boys in 1943, and that was all fine and dandy until they thought, hmm, how can we make this just like 10 times worse? So they rented an open top Mercedes and cruised around that heavily Jewish part of London in costume and in character as Nazi officers, all while hitting the old, uh, the old uh, straight arm salute. <laughs> If you know what I'm saying. Real stand-up fellas, these guys were. Keith didn't stop with the Hitler-based hijinks after that one week, though. He busted out that costume on a pretty regular basis. One particular story that stands out relates to his next-door neighbor, Steve McQueen. Steve had been a giant actor at the time, but had turned into something of a recluse in recent years. Moon moved in next door, and the McQueens invited him and his wife over for a drink. Not the Lightning McQueens. And not the- not them. <laughs> They had a grand old time, engaged in some polite conversation, and then Keith promptly got super high, offered their 16-year-old son drugs, broke into their house, got bit by their dog, and then bit the dog back. You know, normal neighborly activities, Mr. Rogers type beat, you know the vibes. So McQueen calls a buddy of his that happens to be a former FBI agent and tells him to go ahead and fuck Keith over, but to try and do it on the down low. Steve didn't want to attract too much attention with this, so he could avoid the press and paparazzi showing up and interrupting his important plans to eat Fritos off his belly and never leave the house. Keith ended up having to go to a meeting with this former FBI agent along with his lawyer, so the night before, naturally, he decides to hop back into his Nazi gear, go out to the bar, and get absolutely annihilated all night long. The next morning, his lawyer comes to collect the young stormtrooper, who now looks like a hungover Himmler. He sees him still dressed in his full regalia and says, you're not going to court like that, are you? And Moon hits him back with, the only way I go is if I go like this. So Moon whips up to this meeting in front of a judge, a former FBI agent, and his Jewish lawyer, mind you, uh, hungover and fully dressed as a Nazi. The DA, clearly annoyed, asks Moon, is there any significance to your clothing? To which the lawyer quickly interjected that it was for a photo shoot Keith had later before Moon could even open his big fat morbidly obese mouth. This man is commendable. A Jewish lawyer lying to protect a Nazi. Kind of sounds like a Tarantino movie. McQueen stated that he was surprisingly unfazed by this, having already seen Keith dressed in the same outfit, commanding a fleet of men also dressed as Nazis into the ocean at their beachfront property. He really expected nothing less from his new arch nemesis. To test out a new hovercraft he got, Keith once again donned the Nazi outfit strictly for the excuse of using the field binoculars that came with it. His publicist thought it would be a good idea to snap a picture of Keith, still in his Nazi gear, or still on the hovercraft, pretending to be stuck on some train tracks. Which was uh, a creative leap, I will give him that. When I picture a Nazi on a hovercraft, my first thought is not, damn. Uh, how do we work a train into this? When they get to the tracks, they end up in a bit of an oopsie-daisy, which the publicist, who was there at the time, does a pretty good job recounting here. When we got to the level crossing, we pulled the hovercraft off the trailer and onto the railway lines, where Moon clambers onto it. He puts the key into the ignition, and the engine's dead. He's flooded it. So now we have two and a half tons of hovercraft stranded on a railway line with trains still using the track. By this time, I was freaking out. I could see the headlines. PR kills people on train. But Moon was such a quick thinker. He knew there'd be a phone somewhere. He found it, connected to the signal box around the corner, then opened up with a narrative using Cliff Richard's real name. Hello, it's Ari Webb here. You got all the documentation about the heavy plant coming through, didn't you? The guy on the other end was flummoxed, but Moon carried on. Well, we've got 16 Transformers on the back here, so it's gonna need at least half an hour's clearance. So, you better stop the trains going. So, he engineered a stay of execution. We then sent back to the village for something resembling a Land Rover or a breakdown truck, because when we tried to pull the hovercrack back onto the trailer, the rope had snapped. Another half hour elapsed, so he got on the phone again. It's our again. You're not gonna believe this. We've got 200 feet of copper wire all over the track. One of the Transformers has fallen off. The guy on the other end was going absolutely apeshit, but Moon had thrown himself into this role. Well, it's no good you going on like that. We're doing the best we can. He was priceless. He'd really frozen himself into this role of a bloke driving heavy plant across a railway line. We spent about an hour on the crossing line trying to sort it all out before a breakdown truck came. And we never did get that shot. They never got the shot. 
the true tragedy of the story indeed. Moon didn't just like to drive around fucking with the British people by impersonating fascists, no no. Another favorite of his was to dress up as a priest and go yell at the elderly, stage a mugging of himself, or just pretend to get kidnapped. But once again, if that came up on my YouTube homepage, I'm probably clicking. Priest kidnapping prank? Gone sexual? Besides using his Rolls Royce to commit hate crimes or stage a holy hostage situation, Keith also enjoyed using the custom PA system he had set up that would blare whatever he said into a walkie-talkie out of the hidden speakers he had on the outside of his car. He would drive around the small villages of Britain, graciously alerting them of fake tsunamis, earthquakes, a herd of oncoming poisonous snakes, or the fact that Parliament has decided to relocate the entire country's immigrant population to their local jurisdiction. Keith would almost never drive his own car, counting on his trusty chauffeur to keep her steady during his constant unhinged tomfoolery. On one occasion, the driver managed to barely save Moon and a friend's collective asses by pretending to be disabled. Let me explain. The friend of Moon's went into a local British tailor and asked for the shop's most durable trousers. When they brought him out, he then complained that they didn't look strong enough, at which point Keith walked in and offered to help the man test them. They then ripped the pants completely in half, followed by the shop owner attempting to call the police, before the driver hopped in on one leg and crutches and said, Are those one-legged trousers? Just what I've been looking for! And then he bought each leg separately. Never to be outdone, Keith also once pretended to be disabled in a much more spectacular fashion in order to get out of a meeting. Keith was running more than an hour late for an interview with his publicist because he had been drinking all day at the pub, so he then went out to buy plaster and bandages, wrapped himself up like a crippled mummy, and hobbled into the interview with a limp and a walking stick. His PR people said, uh, oh no, ah oh geez, Keith really did get beat by the street, and they advised that they cancel the interview. Keith said, nah, it's cool, I'm chilling, I'm fine, I can do it, uh, besides the fact that he looked like the crippled fish from Spongebob, uh, but he did ask if they could carry him down the four flights of stairs from his apartment to the street. So they carry this drunk fibber down the four flights of stairs and onto the road, when an actual legitimate bus almost hits Keith while he's crossing the street. Keith said, said that the publicist has a go at the lorry driver. You artless bastard, can't you see this man's injured? Have you no art? Have you no soul? You bastard trying to run over a cripple. Keith then recounts, We went on to the interview, and in the middle of it, after about four brandies, I just ripped off all the plaster and jumped up on my seat and started dancing. Imagine carrying the man who has been making you wait for hours while drinking and collecting supplies for this exact bit down four flights of stairs, only for him to just rip it all off and then hit the gritty on the table. I would have gone out and actually got a bus license just so I could go and hit this guy. In 1975, Keith's friend Oliver Reed was walking the red carpet for a film premiere when suddenly all he could see was cream and custard. He had just been hit by, just been struck by even, a smooth pie in the face. A man in a suit and sunglasses then walks up to Reed and hands him a card that says, Pie in the Face International. You have been selected by Mr. Keith Moon to become a member. In the card was a certificate stating, You are a member, sponsored by Keith Moon. It wasn't all puppies and rainbows bows for Keith all the time though. A life of booze, bombs, and brain damage can put a guy pretty down in the dumps from time to time. While flying from Africa back to England, Keith got a strange, uncontrollable urge to break into the cockpit of the plane and begin drumming on the control panel. And if there's anything we've learned from this video, when Keith Moon has an uncontrollable, hedonistic urge to do something, it gets done. He breaks in, nearly crashes the plane, and is then subdued and escorted off the aircraft after it is turned around and grounded back in Africa. I do feel bad for the people on that flight back to England who got grounded and had to figure something else out, but like, what a story, right? Yeah, I'm sorry, honey. I'm gonna be late to Christmas. A rock star broke into the cockpit and started trying to play Stairway to Heaven on the steering wheel again. Keith was then drug tested by the authorities, passed, and was allowed to fly back home the next day. And like, I know this guy gets away with a lot of shit, like, an inhuman amount of shit. I get that he's basically Ricky from Trailer Park Boys. And I know airports basically just handed you a bottle of Prosecco and a handgun when you got in an airplane before 2001, but... I mean, come on, man. This dude broke into the cockpit of an international flight, intentionally tampered with the controls, and nearly crashed the plane, and you're gonna let him go just because he was sober while he did it? 
Doesn't that kind of make it, like, worse? At least if he was thwacked out of his mind, he would have a decent excuse for his irrational, reckless behavior. But if he was sober while it was going on, that just means that he is genuinely the type of guy who would crash a 747 for the funsies. I'm sorry, but, uh, British guy plays the drum real good, uh huh, huh. It's not gonna cut it on this one, okay? That is a bad boy. He deserves a spanking at the very least. I guess there's a dark side to the moon. And on that note, I will conclude this tale of Moon the Loon, the hotel horror, the princely prankster, the bathroom bomber himself. There was obviously way too much stuff to talk about regarding this guy, and maybe I should learn to cut myself off, but like... No. <laughs> No, I don't think I'll do that. Because of that, these videos take absolutely fucking forever to make, and unlike some other YouTubers, I actually have something somewhat resembling a life. Uh, but I'd like to change that, so if you would consider supporting me on Patreon, maybe one day I can quit my job, leave my friends and family, and become a full-time internet gremlin whose only purpose is to farm clout and make you giggle at penis-based content. If you like the video, uh, like the video, you moony-ass loon. Keep an eye out for that rock video I mentioned up top, and until then, I love you, stay safe, buckle up, wear a jacket, pad your walls, never go outside, don't eat glass unless you really want to, and I will see you in the future.